right, Big Blue in the Bronx is back, and we have another off-season Mets video for y'all. But before we even get into that, I know it's been, you know, a couple days since the uh, last video or live stream. Just hoping everyone's having a good Christmas. Hope everyone's getting ready for the new year as uh, we're about a few days away from it. So hope everyone is enjoying the time with family and friends for the holiday break as I know I have and I know uh, the uh, twins have as well. But nevertheless, we do have a video for y'all today. Um, not going to have any live streams until 2024, but did want to get this out to y'all um, for some content. In this video, I got three New York Mets uh, pitching options that uh, could be on the team or, uh, you know, guys I, I'd still like them to pursue in free agency. And, you know, we, we, this is more the pivot away from the Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Obviously, we all know he's not a New York Met. He's not a New York Yankee. He is an L.A. Dodger. But before we even get into that, guys, make sure you like, comment, subscribe this video. Make sure to turn on those post notifications so you know uh, when the videos come on and when uh, content is released. And also, share out, guys. Do your part and share out. But anyway, let's get into uh, three options here that I think the Mets could do. And now, these are all guys that I would definitely take. But I also made it, you know, one to three the most realistic to the least realistic. So I guess the pitchers would be, I don't know, worst to best in that sense. But uh, it's not impossible, any of these. These aren't impossible to get any of these guys. They are all free agents. You know, I don't think uh, David Stearns and Steve Cohen are in the business of trading for any pitchers right now. Because I don't think they want to truly give up any of their prospects, okay? They're stockpiling talent. That's what they've been pretty much doing all offseason with all the uh, all the minor league arms they're getting. As uh, they rank very high in the stuff plus. But nevertheless, we got three starters that they could go after. And uh, we'll start off with number one, Lucas Giolito. Okay, this uh, he's a free agent now. Now, uh, you look at his career, right? Uh, obviously, he was a big piece in the trade that uh, way back in the day, I think it was 2016 that it happened, or 2017, when he got traded along with a bunch of prospects. It was in the Adam Eaton deal. Remember when Washington was trying to load up when they had Bryce Harper and try and win with him? Well, that was the uh, deal that sent Adam Eaton over there. And the White Sox, you know, they used him. And you know what? He had a lot of good years with the White Sox. You know, 2017 was good, then 2018 was a bit of a rough one for him. But then after that, he figured it out. He, he uh, became an all-star in 2019. You know, he he was one of those players that they were trying to build around. But, you know, at the, at the time, you know, when they were stockpiling prospects, you know, they were getting rid of their uh, older guys. But they were, they were getting Giolito. And, you know, at the time, they were getting Yohan Mankata. And they were get, adding Luis Robert and Eloy Jimenez. You know, all these young guys. Tim Anderson they had. You know, all these guys that they wanted that they don't have anymore. Because they're back into another rebuild. And, you know, for, you know, 2019, 2021, he was an all-star in one of those years. He was pretty consistent of a 3-4, 3-5 ERA guy. And then, you know, 2022 kind of hurt him. Not a really good year, bad year. And then 2023, same thing. Not a good year. So why is it that uh, he went from really good, a good pitcher, you know, maybe a number three guy in your rotation to a... Uh, back into the rotation guy well my theory is and you know i could be wrong you know there could be other stuff that nobody knows what's going on with this man but we have to look at it this right uh the white Sox were a dif dysfunctional team i mean the amount of uh you know whether it's bad ownership bad leadership from management you know a lot of issues and there was a lot of reports um with their practice habits and all the uh stuff and you know what for Players can only play good for a bad team for so long, you know. And I'm not giving an excuse to G. Lito for playing bad, but I think that, you know, that does have an effect on a pitcher. When you're just continually sucking and not going anywhere and not advancing, well, it kind of hurts after a while. And the White Sox have been in disarray for quite some time now. And then also, you know, he bounced around last year. Uh, so if you want to argue that point, you can. Well, he was traded to two teams, or he was traded to, it, it was weird, he was traded to the Angels, and he went to Cleveland. Neither team was good last year, and he was awful, both those teams. But again, he probably just doesn't want to play for a crap team. Now, I'm not saying the Mets are going to be this all-world team, but he might need a change of scenery from a uh, horrible team to a uh, 
at least an okay team. I mean, I think the Mets will be okay. We'll see what happens in the offseason. But let's take a look at some of the numbers, right? So, you know, after the uh, the four ERA, right, the last year for the White Sox, he pitched a three seven nine ERA. That's not bad. And then with the Angels and Cleveland uh, Guardians, that's why the ERA is very inflated because it went shot to a four eight. With the Angels in uh, six starts, he had a six eight nine ERA, and with the Guardians in six starts, he had a seven oh four ERA. And you know the uh, the FIP is very similar to the ERA. It's actually you know with the White Sox, it was it, his FIP was about a uh, four four three. So that was kind of how he was more similarly pitching to, but. Again, you know, there are some positives here. Uh, for instance, right, he threw the most innings he did last year. And the Mets need, qu like, innings out of their starting pitching. 184 innings thrown last year. The year before, 161. The year before that, 178. So this guy can eat up innings, and they needed that because they had a lot of injuries. Remember the start of the year, Verlander was out. You know, Quintana missed a couple months with us, so... That didn't really help them at all. I mean, so many injuries to this uh, Mets starting staff last year, and they just never got on track, and it ended up being a disaster. So they need a do, they do need a guy that can do that. Now, there's a you know that's a good thing. You know, we've seen him. You know, he he has the talent. He does. You know, uh, the major concern last year in terms of statistics that jumps out at me is the amount of homers he gave up. Uh, 41 homers, which I believe led all of baseball last year, if I'm not mistaken. You guys can fact check me on that. 41 homers given up. Now, I do think it was a bit of an admiration year because you look at the years past, right? Uh, you know, 2018, 27 homers. 2019, 24 homers. Uh, 2021, he gave up 27 homers. 2022, 24 homers. You know, I had to skip 2020 because of the COVID year. But again, 41 homers is a lot. But I do think it was a one-off year for Giolito, and I don't think he'll be given up 40 homers. I think he'll be given up. I think it is a bit of an issue. I mean, don't get me wrong. It is an alarming number, but you like to see that where he usually is with between 27 and 24, which, again, maybe it's a little above the average, you know, maybe around average, but we, we want to see that number around there because we don't want to see Lucas Giolito in a Mets uniform giving up 40-plus bombs. That is not... Uh, what we want to sign up for. We want to sign up for when this guy, you know, he, he had good seasons, you know, he had, you know, the 3.48 ERA, he, 2019, he was an all-star, you know, and it, that's what, that's what we're looking at for Lucas Giolito. We're trying to get him to be a three, four guy, guy with, you know, talent, kind of, kind of in the same boat as Luis Severino, you know, maybe he'll get a bigger contract because he has been asking for a multi-year deal. I don't know if it's three or four years, but you know, I could be, I wouldn't be surprised if they gave him a two year deal. Um, or maybe a one year with like incentives, because this is a guy that they're going to try and fix and they're going to try and, uh, rebuild as they, you know, have this new pitching lab, which I've been, uh, talking about for a couple months now on the channel, but nevertheless, uh, we have to remember he's better than the depth we had, or we had last year. He's better than David Peterson. Better than Tyler Miguel, okay? I'm sure he's a better option than Jose Buto, although I think he has some promise. But, again, Lucas Giolito wouldn't be a bad three or four starter. You know, kind of in the, you know, because you, you got Sanga, you know, is your frontline guy, it looks like for now. It doesn't look like they're going to get anyone else, unless we'll see who I say, else say in this video. And then you roll with some mid-rotation guys. Let's say you get Giolito, you still got Quintana. You still, you got Hauser now, you got Severino, you got a couple guys that could be uh, in this rotation, and it's better, it's better than what you had last year. I'll say that. It is better than what they had last year because we know how bad the staff was last year. One of the worst in baseball, in my opinion. And, you know, it's been said that in the past that, you know, the reason for Giolito struggles uh, have been because, you know, ever since the sticky stuff ban, and that's why the uh, struggles have been for two seasons. Now... The only statistic that really backs that up is the dip in strikeout. I looked at a 2021 season for when it happened, and that did take a hit. But it's weird because every other stat got better. So I really can't say, you know, the ERA got better, the walk percentage got better, the, uh, the FIP got better. Like So it's really, you know, uh, you really can't say that that had a, too much of a negative impact. Now, one thing I did learn on Wardy's channel, you guys can go sub to him, probably one of the best Mets content creators out there as this man went through a divorce during the all-star break 
So maybe that had a mental impact on him too and why he was pitching bad. Maybe he was going through that and then pitching every five days. You know, that's probably not easy to do. But again, uh, that is the number one option I think uh, is most realistic for the New York Mets. Now, next guy up, another guy. This guy's actually from the uh, Japan League, and I know we've all heard of him, and that's Shota Imanaga. That's right. Uh, now, he is, I guess, the... Uh, after Yoshinobu Yamamoto, the second best pitcher on the market. Now, he has been posted already, and I believe he was posted in November because I know he teams have until January 11th uh, until they have to, uh, until they can, uh, what's it called, uh, you know, until um, they can get him because that's when uh, his posting day expires. And, you know, this guy's been pitching with the Japanese League uh, since 2016. And I gotta say, the numbers do look impressive. They really do. Uh, he's a lefty, and he's got a. Uh, I, was, I forgot who was saying this on MLB Network, but he does have a uh, low arm angle and a rising fastball. So it is. It might be tough for hitters to pick up, which is pretty good. You know, you don't really see that a lot in starting pitchers, but that could be something good. That could be a little un, uh, surprising for hitters to see. And. To me, uh, and it seems a general consensus, he's another middle of the rotation arm guy. You know, he's not going to be a Yamamoto. He he's probably not even better than Kodai Senga on this staff, in my opinion. But you know, you a lot of teams are interested in him. A lot of teams need starting pitching, and this guy can help out someone. Uh, now he is he is thirty years old, so he's not as a, he's not a twenty five year old mid twenties guy like Yamamoto. So I wouldn't expect obviously his kind of contract. I'd say anywhere from Kodai Seng is the baseline of a five-year, $75 million deal to maybe anywhere, to at most $100 million. That's uh, where I think that contract would go for if he wanted a five-year deal. You know, somewhere with the uh, annual average of $25 million to, or maybe, not $25 million, I can't do math now, um, $13 million a year to about $20 million a year. That's what I'd say is uh, Imanaga, the... Uh, the contract type that he would be looking for, I'm assuming. Uh, I can't imagine it's too much more over $100 million if I'm wrong. But, you know, this guy has had plenty of uh, good seasons in Japan. So it's not like he's had, like, just a few good seasons. He's been pitching since 2016. And, you know, he's he's pitched for multiple teams uh, in his career. I believe it's two, if I'm not mistaken. But a lot of the uh, years where the ERA is... You know, around the high twos, low threes, you know, even some, you know, years where it's, you know, 204, which is like, wow, that's like, that's pretty impressive, actually. And that's pretty good uh, to see him uh, succeed there. Now, one thing I really do like about this guy, and it really does show from last year, is the uh, the walks per inning. This guy doesn't has really, really good control, and that is something that... You know, some of the Mets pitchers lost last year because uh, that they just stunk with it. But you look at his numbers, right? I'm going to read you the uh, the past few seasons of uh, what this guy did. So, walks per nine, ready? 1.5 in 2023. 1.4, uh, excuse me, 1.4 in 2023. God, I cannot read. Uh, then we had another one, then we had 1.8 in 2022. Then we had a... To a 1.9 in 2021. So you guys can see this guy does not walk a lot of guys. He's got very good control and he dom. And you know, the reason I like to make the comparison to Sanga, not just because the age, but and I know he's a lefty, Sanga's a righty. But once Sanga learned command, you know, he dominated that second half. I know it was on a bad team and the season was pretty much over after June, but he dominated as an ace for the team. And you know, if Imanaga, Imanaga has already has the control then that could be a really trustworthy arm. You know, he's a decent strikeout pitcher. I don't really see him as that uh, uh, a strikeout artist. You know, he's not uh, going to rack it up in terms of that. He had 10.6 strikeouts his last year. Now, one thing that is a little, con uh, that can be concerning is the uh, the home run ball. Uh, not that he's uh, crazy giving it up, I should say. But, you know, last year, 159 innings pitched, 18 homers given up. Eh, I mean, that, and, you know, we've seen guys from Japan have a problem with the home run ball. Uh, you know, you can think of Masahiro Tanaka, for example. But nevertheless, uh, that could be something to uh, look out for. And 
again, decent strikeout pitcher, good ERA, and remember, just he's also from Japan, so you got to remember two things. There's a posting fee, so if you pay him, you got to pay the club that gets him, right? But also this, he's got to adjust to the ball because, and it's funny, a lot of the, uh, some of the MLB pitchers have even said, I remember, I think it was Joe Ryan of the Minnesota Twins that said that he likes the uh, uh, Japanese ball better, um, or the style of ball, but it's a lot smaller in size over there so it's easier to hold and it's easier to grip so you know Imanaga coming here he's got to learn that you know he's got to learn the you know be used to five day rest because not all Japanese pitchers are adjusted to that and point um, important case like every he's got to learn the culture in America he's got to learn the language a lot of stuff to learn for Imanaga as it is for every foreign player that comes here no, no matter what sport you play but Nevertheless, the uh, the last guy I wanted to talk about, you Yankee fans definitely know him. Uh, the most, I guess, I don't want to say he's, you know, not attainable, but the uh, un most uh, unlikely to happen uh, in terms of Mets signing him out of these three options. I could be wrong. I still could be wrong, and, you know, they could something could come out of left field. But Jordan Montgomery, I am definitely not opposed to this uh, man at all, okay? I really have raved about him. I've, uh, you know, given him a lot of props on this channel. Now, he has been really effective, especially last year. And here's what I'll say. The Yankees, when they had him, right, he looked like a, you know, a number four starter, right, at times, maybe number three. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I don't think the Yankees used him right because the Yankees didn't see his value, and he skyrocketed after that. Remember, they traded him for Harrison Bader, and that trade didn't really work out so well. That was also because Bader was injured a lot. But more, Jordan Montgomery pitched about a full season because he pitched the, the second half of 2022 and the first half of 2023 for the Cardinals. And he pitched, he was there, you know, at times he was their only reliable starting pitcher. But he was still pitching really good. Then he goes on to the Rangers and he even turns it up a notch in, well, with them, you know, starting 11 games in the regular season last year before we even get into the postseason, which he was incredible with. And... You know, you you talk about what he is. You know, he's never going to be that guy that's an ace. All right, he's not. That's not what he is. But 2023 in that postseason, when you know the team that just won the World Series, the Rangers. Yeah, no, he was uh, freaking incredible. I have to say. So you look at some of the games he's pitched in the postseason. I think he had one, uh, or, or I should say, maybe two games that were like so-so. You know, not great. Uh, the game, I think it was against Baltimore he pitched. And the game against uh, the, his last World Series game against the... Or his only World Series game against Arizona. But, you know, you look uh, you you look at, you know, the the series against Houston. He was... He pitched fantastic, you know. Pitched good against Texas. You know, just incredible, incredible, incredible. Uh, career 2-6-3 ERA in the postseason, which is really good, really what you want to see out of your uh, a reliable starter. Because, you know, remember last year, you know, the Mets, they did sign Justin Verlander. What was the biggest knock they said? They said he struggled in the postseason. And you know what? I concur with that. I completely concur with that. Now, they didn't really matter because they didn't get to the postseason with him. But you got to show that you can pitch in the postseason because it is a different atmosphere than the regular season. And Jordan Montgomery had showed last year that he's a – valuable pitcher in the postseason and he's not a frontline starter but he might be a two i think he's a number two starter at best maybe number three but you look at his numbers right uh starting out with the yankees he was a uh you know i'd say a mid to high three era but then that dropped to a low three and a 279 era with texas last year which was you know phenomenal now he's not a strikeout pitcher he doesn't really have a put away pitch and i guess that's his biggest critique doesn't have a really good put away pitch i mean the strikeouts for nine it's going to hover around 7, 8 over the past few seasons. That's okay. This guy can still get outs. You need guys that can give you 6 inning, 2, 3, earn run ball. And I think that's exactly what Jordan Montgomery is. And I don't think that's fine because I think he's got a good fastball, which we'll get into in a sec. And it, it complements his off-speed stuff, which, you know, he's got the changeup and the curveball. Another reason I like Jordan Montgomery a lot, look at the durability of this guy. 32 games started last year, right? 32 games started 2022. 30 games started 2021. So he's shown he can be healthy in the past few seasons. 
you know, there isn't anything underlying with him. You, you know, he's he looks like he's ready to keep on rolling. You know, I know uh, he's age 30 right now. But nevertheless, you know, he, he does look like he can uh, uh, keep on chugging. And here's what I mean that the uh, Yankees, when I say they didn't use him correctly earlier. So earlier in his career, I'll give you, you know what, I'll give you his uh, his last year with the Yankees. Uh, that's just because, you know, it's not fair to use the other seasons. Because I want to show the direct comparison of how he changed after he left them. So his fastball percentage, his four-seam percentage, was at a 38%. His cutter percentage was at a 13%, right? Now, the curveball and changeup, that's pretty much stayed, you know, around... Uh, at like 23, 22% around those marks for his career. So I didn't really change much with that. But here's the uptick in fastball and the lowest usage in the cutter. His four-seam fastball, the Yankees did not want him to use, jumped from 38% in 2021 to last year between two teams to 53%. The cutter usage jumped from 13%. It is now only thrown 1.6% of the time from Jordan Montgomery. That tells you he's a lot more comfortable using that four-seam fastball as opposed to the cutter the Yankees wanted him to throw. And it shows, because of the stats, that it, the fastball was probably his most effective pitch. I know it's not a blow-by-you fastball, but he can locate it pretty good. So, again, and it's funny because this is the hardest he's ever been throwing, averaging around 93 miles an hour, a little more than 93 miles an hour with that four-seamer. Uh, he never really did that with the Yankees consistently. And it's shown that, you know, he is a good pitcher. He can pitch postseason games, you know, despite what his clown GM has said, Brian Cashman, or old ex-GM, I should say. Uh, and then the last bit of note is, remember, New York Mets, we have Carlos Mendoza now. He was the bench coach while Jordan Montgomery was in the Yankees, so maybe there's a good relationship there. I'm not uh, saying anything bad, but uh, I don't know how good the relationship was, but I can imagine, you know, it has to be somewhat good. I don't think there's been any bad blood. So that could be a plus for the Mets if they did want to turn and go after Jordan Montgomery. Now, those are the three guys I think they should get. Obviously, there are more guys on the market. You know, I've seen, you know, Trevor Bauer's name pop up. Maybe he returns to Major League Baseball. Uh, Blake Snell is a guy that he, remember, he won a Cy Young, but uh, not really too keen on him. You got more depth guys. Maybe if they wanted to target him, Michael Lorenzen. Okay, sure. Uh, there's other depth guys available, but uh, those are just the three guys I think uh, that uh, I would really love for this team to acquire. Maybe not all of them, but uh, maybe one or two of them, or, well, who knows? Let's see what they do. Um, let's see how David Stearns uh, continues to try and fix this ball club in the offseason, because uh, I think about a month or a month and a half away, pitchers and catchers report for training camp. So, you know, the offseason, uh, we're still in the middle of it, but uh, uh, not for too much longer, I should say, so... With that being said, guys, you know, stay tuned for more content, and I will see you in the next one.